Welcome to the evening services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, April the 11th. I'm Mark Syme, the minister here at the Northfield Church. Uh, we will be singing uh, three songs, then observing the Lord's Supper. Uh, one more song, and then I will have a message uh, for all of us that I hope will be uh, uplifting and that uh, you can take with you through the evening. So if you have your songbooks, Songs of Faith and Praise, if you would turn them, please, first to number 508, 508. <clears throat> we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, and 4. How wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. How wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. And turn your books to number 754. We haven't sung this song in a long time, so I hope we, uh, I hope we get it right. Seven fifty-four. Faith of our fathers, living still, in spite of dungeons, fire and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy when where we hear that glorious word. Faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true to Thee till death. Three. Faith of our fathers, we will love both friend and foe in all our strife, and preach thee to as love knows how by kindly words and virtuous life. 
faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true to Thee till death. And to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 335. 335. In memory of the Savior's love, we keep the sacred feast. Where every humble, contrite heart is made a welcome guest. By faith we take the bread of life with which our souls are fed. The cup in token of his blood that was for sinners shed. Beneath his banner thus we Sing the wonders of his love and hear anticipate by faith the heavenly feast of As we gather about the Lord's table, um, uh, we have a couple of things in mind. One, we're communing with our God. And two, we're communing with our God uh, on the basis that uh, he sent his son uh, to come to earth to live in human form, uh, to live and breathe and uh, be uh, susceptible to everything that a human could be susceptible to, yet led a perfect life. And because he led a perfect life, he was able to make a perfect sacrifice. No longer were sacrifices necessary because Jesus made the one-time sacrifice for each one of us on that cross. He died and uh, he gave his life that we might live. And so we have symbols before us. We have the bread, which uh, is representative of the body. We have the fruit of the vine, which rep was representative of the blood that he shed. Both have significance to us. He gave his body up for you and I. He shed his blood that we might have forgiveness of sins. And so as we um, just try to hone in for just a, a couple of moments this evening, I pray that uh, we will hearken back to Calvary as if it happened moments ago, not uh, as if it were something isolated that happened 2,000 years ago. And let's keep it fresh in our hearts and fresh in our minds so that this sacrifice that Jesus made has a wonderful significance to each one of us. Let's pray first for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to give his body in our stead we're, uh, we're just so thankful that he made that perfect sacrifice, a sacrifice of a sinless nature, a sinless being, and that he gave up his body for uh, each one of us. As we partake of this bread, let's think of that sacrifice. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. pray for the cup. We know that blood had to be shed so that our sins could be forgiven. 
It was the blood of an innocent, perfect human being. It was the blood that washes our sins away. And so as we reflect on that this morning and gathering around the table, let's uh, remember the, the great significance of Jesus' sacrifice for each one of us. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This completes the Lord's Supper, and, and now we are going to turn to something else that we do because we have been instructed to do it in our Bibles, and that is to lay by in store on the first day of the week. And as it is the first day of the week, I pray that you have purposed in your heart uh, and that uh, you have thought of how much you have been blessed with as you give back to the Lord. The wonderful thing to know is that when we give back to the Lord, we're not giving ours, we're giving His, because all things uh, come from Him. Uh, let's pray for the giving. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to give with gratitude. Help us to give with generosity. Help us to understand that there are so many ways to give. There are ways to give of our time and to give of our efforts. But at this time, we're thinking of the material gifts uh, that uh, keep your church functioning and that uh, keep us um, uh, attempting to save souls for you. Bless us in this endeavor and bless us in our generosity. We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And let's sing one more song before the lesson if you will turn to number 213. Two thirteen. He is able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me the day. He is able, more than able. To handle anything that comes my way. He is able, more than able, To do much more than I could ever dream. He is able, more than able, To make me what he wants me to be. I'm sure the Lord was praised through our song, and I uh, hope that uh, for just a few minutes we can get into his word, and there are some things that uh, I will share with you that uh, will be significant. If you uh, were at services this morning, uh, you knew uh, from the announcements and from the bulletin that uh, the um, uh, lesson this evening will be entitled Defining Faith. Defining Faith. You know, uh, in our everyday vernaculars, our everyday vocabulary, uh, there are words um, that have very, very set definitions. There are words that we can hone in on and say, this word means this. It means that. There's no variance. It's a straight line. This evening, we're going to talk about faith. And um, faith is one of those words that's not like that. Um, so what we're going to do this evening is we're going to take four looks at faith. And we are going to look at faith contextually in, in four different ways. 
And you know, it's such a powerful word. Right? It, it's such a, a, a monumental word. It's what our, our core belief system is actually all about. It's all about faith. And so first, I would like to look at faith meaning something that is based on knowledge. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 24, Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. It's something that we have to believe. Now, why would we why would we believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Did we pluck this out of the air? Is this just something convenient to say? Is this something that makes us feel all warm and fuzzy? No, it's a faith that's based on knowledge. Knowledge that Jesus was real, that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith comes by information that establishes a fact. And so with that, in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, the Apostle Paul was able to say with Holy Spirit-inspired confidence, faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he is saying that the word of God gives us the truths that we need upon which we can base our faith. And you know what? Uh, it, it's that way in many aspects of our life. As a former science teacher, uh, I saw that all the time. Science-based fact. And you know what? Here is the wonderful thing that I liked about science. Science is always willing to change. When new facts come to life, then they, they supersede some of the older ones. And the next thing you know, uh, we have more relevant truths. And so the faith that we have in things is based upon our knowledge. This is what God expects us. He expects of us to believe what is true. And so as we gather information about the Lord's word, and then we read the Lord's word, we have faith and we trust in that information. It's the basis of our whole belief system. And it's so very important that the Hebrew writer gives us maybe one of the best definitions of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, or I might say the important aspects of it, when the Hebrew writer says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. And let's read the rest of this. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that seek him. And so all of these things pile into this wonderful lump of things that we believe in through the knowledge that we have accumulated through the Lord's word. And that is our faith. First, first. Faith means trust in something based upon knowledge. Let's look at a second idea. The faith means a system of faith. Now, there's, there are contrasts in the New Testament between salvation, which is gained by a system of works, and those that are actually saved by a system of faith. 
and in reality, I threw a curveball at you because actually there is no salvation based on works, even though some have tried to develop that system. I'll, I'll work my way into heaven. In the book of Galatians, Paul tries to show us that we are saved by a system of faith, not by a system of works where he says we are saved by faith, okay? Not by those things that we do. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, Luke records this for us. A great many of the priests were becoming obedient, get this, to the faith. The faith means the system of faith. And that's what we are in. We are in a system of faith. There's this wonderful verse in Jude, only one chapter in Jude. And if we look at the third verse of Jude, here's what the writer says. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. That's to us. Jude says that we are, con are to contend for what? The faith. This system of faith. And so, although men speak uh, of different ways to be saved, the Bible teaches us that there is only one faith. And we can only be saved through that one faith. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, Paul records there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, get ready for this, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father over all, and through all, and in all. Isn't that a powerful verse? You see the oneness of it? There's only one baptism. There's only one hope. There's only one spirit. There is only one calling. And yes, there is only one faith that we base all of this upon. Now, there are several terms in the New Testament that are somewhat synonymous uh, with the faith. For example, the doctrine and the faith may be considered synonymous. The truth and the faith may be considered synonymous. The word and the faith may be considered synonymous. Each of them simply mean it is what God has given to each one of us to guide us, to let us know how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live through this system of faith. When we stray out of the faith, we stray out of the truth. We've strayed from the doctrine. We've strayed from the word. And we do this simply because we want to understand, number one, how we're supposed to worship our God and two, how we are to be saved, where salvation is going to come from. And so this system of faith is based on putting our truth, our faith in Jesus Christ. And there's no other way because there is only one faith. There's only one system of faith, and that comes down through God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and our being aided by the wonderful Holy Spirit. Three, 
Faith means having a clear conscience. All right? It means having a clear conscience. In Romans 14, 23, now there was a lot of talk about eating meat and some of it was related to eating meat sacrificed to idols, but some of it was about eating meat and whether or not it offended our brothers or our sisters in our eating of the meat. And here's what Paul said, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. And so our conscious system builds up based upon our faith. All right? And what that does is that gives us a clear conscience. We all know what it means to have a guilty conscience. It drives people just um, literally off the wall when their consciences are, are pierced and there is guilt within their consciousness. If he's saying you're not to violate your conscience. He says, this person is not eating in faith because he's violating what he believes in his heart he ought to do. Now, maybe we don't have uh, uh, the problem of thinking of what we should eat or whether we should eat meat, but there may be some other ways that we might violate our conscience. As a matter of fact, there are some things that God may say that are okay to do, but they may still violate our personal consciences. And so if one goes against our conscience, we're not doing the activity in the faith that we are supposed to. Therefore, we violate our conscience and we will feel guilt about it. For example, if you know someone, and I had a very dear friend within the church that uh, finally, after years and years of drinking, uh, finally uh, realized that he was an alcoholic, and uh, he dried out, and he went into Alcoholics Anonymous, and he, he became a, a great um, supporter for other people. Well, because of that, and because I knew that, I could not in good conscience even have a glass of wine when this person was around. It violated my conscience. It might be all right for me to have done it, but my conscience was violated. And therefore, I looked at that for me as being sinful. And so I could not do that. Finally, number four, faith is also used. And this is, now we're, we're going to get into some pretty heavy duty stuff here. Faith was also used as one of the manifestations of the spirit in the first century. Now, we all love 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, and we, we quote it all the time. I use it in weddings, and, and uh, you know some of the greatest things said about love are contained in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But one of the reasons I think the, the Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13 was because of what was going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul lists nine of the manifestations, nine miraculous gifts that were given in the first century through the laying on of hands of the apostles. Now, we know a few of them. We know that the one that has even come down, and some people still believe that it's going on here in the, in the, in the 21st century, and that is in speaking of tongues, speaking in tongues. 
but he, he also, uh, the, the gift of teaching and the gift of interpreting tongues, uh, the gift of prophesying, uh, these were all gifts that were given in the first century. They could only be manifested by the laying on of hands of the apostles. And so those gifts ceased. The Bible tells us that they ceased. When I was a, a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I think that's referencing what happened in the first century. As soon as there were no apostles left, if I was living in the first century and one of the apostles laid their hands on me and I was able to do miraculous things, I could not confer those miraculous things onto anyone else. Only the apostles could do that. And they were supernatural uh, things. And these people in the first century were able to do unbelievable things. Paul, even, you know, he alluded to something that Jesus alluded to. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, he said, If I have faith so as to remove mountains. Jesus said that three times. Jesus talked about the faith to move mountains in Matthew 17, 20, in Matthew 21, 21, and Mark eleven twenty three. 23. And Luke uses somewhat similar language when Jesus said these words in, uh, in uh, Mark, uh, Matthew 17, 6. He said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, I'm sorry, Luke 17, 6, Luke 17, 6, he said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would be able to say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, it would obey you. And so uh, there was this manifestation of faith in the first century where these uh, people who had this, these gifts conferred upon them by uh, the laying on of hands of the apostles. And again, he, he lists uh, nine of those. And one of those, <laughs> one of those, surprisingly enough, is why I brought it up, is faith. That is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Now, that's not the faith that one gains by studying God's word. That's not the faith that's decided upon whether someone is going to eat meat or not. That's not the faith that is a system of faith. That was the, a miraculous gift of faith. It was a supernatural feat, uh, gift to be able to do wonderful things in the first century. And, and that was very, very important so the word of God could be spread more readily. So, what is the uh, final sum of all of these things that I've talked about? Uh, faith is trust based on knowledge. Faith is the, the faith is the system of faith. Faith means having a clear conscience, and faith was also used as a manifestation uh, of the Spirit in the first century. Um, when one sees the word faith in the Bible, and what I've tried to convey to you this evening is that it could mean several things. So one must always look at the context to see which meaning of faith it's talking about. Now, for us this evening, and it's how I'm going to end the lesson, as to the most practical application of the word faith for us today in 2021, is that we must have faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if we have that faith, we can be saved if we act upon it. It is then that you follow the system of faith. If you repent of your sins and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, 
and you are baptized by immersion in water, that this faith becomes whole in you and you become part of the Lord's church. And so with that, what better way to offer the invitation to all of you? The most practical application of faith that we have today is that faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That he came to earth, lived among men, and yet still retained those supernatural powers was still the master teacher. Yet in all things, he was always able to go back and say to the Father, it is your will that needs to be done. And so if you have to come to the Lord, you're doing the will of the Father through Jesus Christ. So if you need to come, please do. I know that we are uh, viewing this through the uh, uh, through the virtual uh, means of YouTube, but please contact uh, one of us here at the church and we will take care of this need for you. If you need to confess your sins one to another, if you need to confess them uh, before the church because you think that it has perhaps brought reproach not only on you but on God and on the church, then we want to hear that and we want to pray for you. And so if you are subject to the invitation, please, wherever you are, think about it and give us a call and we will take care of your needs. Let's all pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this time that we've had together on this Lord's Day evening. I just pray that some of the things that I've said uh, can be searched out and that uh, we can all be Bereans. We can all look at uh, what uh, I've said about faith this evening and uh, uh, take it into our hearts and uh, make it real and uh, make it a part of our life to see uh, how important our faith actually is. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we work out our salvation. Bless us as we work for you in service to your church and help us, dear God, in all ways to, to want to be righteous, holy, and godly people using Jesus as our example. I pray that you are with us uh, this evening, help us to look forward to the next time that we get to meet together. I pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe, and may God bless you all. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood.